Hey everybody, thanks for watching. Today I have a really special and interesting guest with me, Brock Davidson. Hey Brock, how are you? Doing well, thanks Brendan. I met Brock through a friend of a friend and he also came to the Be Better Golf School in Williamsburg, Virginia. Um, when did you start watching Be Better Golf, Brock? I think I started, uh, started following you back when I was living in Hawaii, right around uh, 15, 16 time frame. Uh, okay. I've been following you since the start of your channel for the most part. And I, and uh, Brock came to the Be Better Golf School in Williamsburg. And tell us a little bit about what you, what you, uh, what you did professionally as a career. Uh, well, I served in uh, Naval Special Warfare uh, for 32 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of that was, uh, you know, deploying all over all over the country and, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time in a, in a lot of places other than home. I guess that's the best way to describe it. And when when you say naval special warfare, is that the same as SEALs or is that something different? It is. That's the community at large. Uh, you know, SEALs are part of naval special warfare. Yes, I was a SEAL for 30. Oh, OK. Years. Yeah. Oh, OK. Well, really, then, 26. I was a mechanic, and then I went into the SEALs uh, after I, I started that program early on. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I was a aircraft mechanic for about five years, and then I applied to get into the program. So one of the thing, reasons I wanted to interview uh, Brock here on the Golf Channel was because I think there's a lot we can learn a, about what the SEALs do. And then also Brock has... Um, then for the SEALs also, uh, or for, for that department, Brock, you used to also um, design training programs as well, right? I did. I uh, did various uh, stages of my career, whether I was enlisted or uh, once I got a commission, um, you know, you were always, we were always developing training, you know, so uh, mm -hmm. that's, you, you either do that, uh, as an enlisted man or as you go up in senior management positions, you're doing larger programs, just the same training stuff, but on a larger scale, you know, more that plans further ahead. Like, give me an example of something complicated that a Navy SEAL might know nothing about, but they'll have to learn to be an expert in, that the, that a training program will help them be an expert in. Would it be, could be anything. Well, it could be, uh, you know, there's so many disciplines, you know, they always say, you know, you know, so <clears throat> many warfighting disciplines that you're never a master of one. So it's, you know, it's a constant cycle of learning. So, you know, like, you know, one workup, you can do a workup for a year and a half, deploy for six months. When you come back six months later, all the tactics you learned uh, could be completely changed. And that's driven by the environment too, because there's constantly changing. So it's always, it's kind of, I guess you could say the training especially in the SEAL teams as a working document. You know, that's the best mm -hmm. way to put it. It's constantly evolving and changing. What do you think is one of the harder things to, to get people to learn uh, for the SEAL? Uh, really dynamic movements. So, you know, whether it's entering in buildings or doing things that you have to remain calm because it's <clears throat> very important to, very important to be able to, uh, you know, relax, take the information in, and be in a very high stress environment, calm yourself down, make sure you're doing the right thing every single time, um, you know, mainly for safety because you're, you know, you're dealing with guns. So it's uh, when it's dark and scary, it's easy to shoot someone, it's easy to shoot someone. And that's not something you want to happen in training. Right, right, right. Okay. And then how do you think, what do you think from the way you learn to do difficult things like operate these weapons in all these different situations and stuff like that. What do you think the golf community could learn from, from the way that SEALs learn how to do things? Well, it was, uh, you know, one of the things that was just, it was really training hard, always maximizing time in your training. So, so say for example, you, you plan out a, you know, maybe even a 20 hour day. There's a lot of those. But you have to get, you know, you, you have all these transitions where you have to get in a car and drive somewhere. You have to stop and you have to eat, right? So your actual training time, a lot of times, even on a 20-hour day, you know, you might get eight or nine hours of training. You might lose tons between debriefing one evolution to the other, but you're trying to get guys in the field shooting the guns. You know, that's just 
so your transition times are always you know really really important as far as you make those really efficient so that when you are actually training you are you know you're locked in you're focused during the time that you have you know you you're focused in on your gun time so you're always trying to build efficiency removing transition time and building in actual training time when you're doing something for example like if it was if it was run more poorly it could like lunch could end up taking like an hour and a half and bathroom time could end up taking a whole bunch of time and um there's just like chit chat stuff and right so yeah as as little as as you want to put the the time to use for what you're trying to do and where right. the limited where, you know they would they would send us around the country to train so uh when you would either go out ahead or before when when guys hit the ground is it was you know um you know purely you would get as much sleep as you need just per uh just to make sure that you know and it might be minimal but just you you get minimal amount of sleep so you could get maximum amount of training time so what do you think are some of these uh not so much in like a golf school because that's pretty rare for somebody to go to one to go to one um but where where do you think are some ways when like so there's a the typical format is like an hour golf lesson when the seals are trying to when you're trying to do like learn something complicated and like uh say like there's a bunch of different parts to it so you got to learn how to like load and reload like this weapon right and then you got to learn how to move around and stuff but there might be like a a certain part of that that is just like a block for someone like that they're not getting past. yes now will will the seals like stop like in a golf lesson like if somebody's like let's say their their swing has a bunch of problems but like it starts with like a bad takeaway some right. teachers will will just get focused on, hey, let's not do anything else until we fix this takeaway. And other teachers will say, like, okay, we're going to keep working on that, but let's let's do a more whole picture. How how do how do how does the seals really go across something where it's like, okay, this guy is not getting this part of it? What you know, what do they do at that point? Right. Well, it was always, a, you know, one thing. One thing that was always a given, like in any kind of teaching, any kind of teaching environment, whether it's golf, whether it's guns whether it's football, basketball, anything, you know, if you have a class, if you, let's say you or anyone else has 10 people in that class, you have to teach to the lowest common denominator in the class. So you, you know, you, you, you figure out through block practice, who's has issues with marksmanship, you have, who has issues with, you know, getting the moves down, you know, as far as however best you can choreograph them in training for doing a building assault or doing, you're running like, uh, you, you know, I'd have a lot of friends that would ask me about uh, immediate action drills. And that's where you're basically, let's say you're in the woods with guns with six other guys. You're basically doing like uh, doing like football plays in the in the woods. Right. You're covering each other. You're actually doing these dynamic movements there. But it was it, it would always come up pretty quick. You know, who who you, the guys that weren't getting it. And then there would be, you know, types of remedial type stuff that they would do, not, not punishment, uh, but it was it was always, you know, very constructive. And we would try to help each other and then, uh, you know, work to get, you know, certain types of movements or things down. So it was definitely the, the learning was definitely a collective approach, but, you know, certainly at a team level uh, individually. Um, you know, there was a lot of times when the training's going hard and fast and you didn't have great days in the in the house, they would call it in the house that, you know, heck, you you might you might be out there after dinner, you know, uh, seven till 11 or even 12 at night, uh, just going through different movements in the building. You're just like dude, there's you, you, you can't kind of, you know, you don't have the luxury of falling behind. Right. So <clears throat> you just did whatever you have to do. Uh, to get the skill you need so you can, you know, contribute to your team. Yeah, and I think that's the, the, the big thing I saw when watching you practice at our golf school and then watching, uh, you know, some other people. And But, like, I think a big difference is that I didn't see too much at our golf school, but I see a lot, like, like out on the range. And, like, people, like, mentally quit pretty fast, like, went with, with golf stuff. Yeah. And, and they get subject to despair, like, really easy um as far as like like it's not working i'm not doing i'm not doing well like and my expectations are are really poor what do you think is a good way to get people if you're trying to motivate somebody to get out of that mentality of like you know 
it's kind of like a it, it's like a quitter's attitude, but then they'll keep playing for like 10 or 20 years longer. So it's like they're right. kind of they don't actually quit, but they kind of like give up on doing what they need to to get better. So how do you, how can people kind of flip the script and become the type of person that can learn and stay focused on a task to get better at it, do you think? Well, I, I would say this, it's certainly, um, it's certainly, and I'm sure you can, you, you can relate with this. Um, one, it, you, you discover really quickly that it's a hard game. People make a living doing it, but it's obvious that, you know, it's obvious you have to put in a lot of time and commitment to the game. You can't, you, 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 you have to kind of, you have to really stay with it and, you know, like you know, you brought Bobby Lopez in, and I've known Bobby a while. You know, Bobby would say, "Hey, you just, sometimes you just got to go to the range and beat it into submission." You know, it was just a repetition. And I knew early on that if I was going to hit the ball as good as I wanted to, then I was really going to have to put in a ton of time in order to do that. But it was a personal goal of mine, and I think a lot of times that's what it is, right? Like people need to decide how good of golf do they really want to play if they want to you know, shoot in the, you know, high eighties, that's, uh, you know, that, that, that can be fun too. What is their goal? You know, my goal always from the beginning was to, you know, even three, four years ago, uh, when I was, you know, 14, 15 handicap, uh, my goal was to become a scratch golfer. Cause I knew it was an elite group. Like there's very few people that actually get to that can do it regularly. Mm-hmm. And I knew the amount of time uh, and I knew it would be not only, I like to think of things not in just individual battles, but I like to think of things in campaigns, right? So if you think of it like, hey, my campaign was to get there, that might take me four or five years to get there. But this is the point of me knowing what my goal is and working towards that goal. So what's the individual goal? What person comes into your school? Yeah, to them, it's just like the... <clears throat> It takes months of work after doing what you guys do and you show all this stuff. It takes, it literally takes months uh, of of, of beating it up, getting there, but it's really dependent. Who's going to give that energy, time and commitment that, you know, their goals are not, are not, you know, really, really solid. Once they decide what their goal is, do they want to shoot in the eighties? Do they want to shoot in the mid seventies? Do they want, those are all different levels of commitment and time. And I think they have to decide that. So I think it's just them deciding where they want to be. And at some point, and I think as they play more and they start get something with a lot of people, they start playing more and they start getting, they want to continue to get better. And then, yeah, that works out well. However, um, I find a lot of people might have the goal of, you know, becoming a scratch golfer or the dream of it, but the reality that it would take them three or four years to maybe break par for the first time, uh, like it did with me then, or even shoot par for the first time, then that's, th- there was a heck of a lot of commitment goal between there. So it was a campaign. It wasn't, it wasn't just a single battle. So it's it's definitely a plan. I think as you get older, I think it's it's you know it's it's certainly harder because one you have more commitments on your time. Yeah. However, the the goal is the key is having that personal goal that you want to get there. You're going to do whatever you need to do to get there. So, and do you think that is that that type of a thing that is like kind of fatal to a golfer if you have this kind of sad sack mentality where you know if things aren't going right you you just kind of like give up. Or can you actually fl- like change that around? Oh, and, absolutely. I do it yeah. all. The time. I'll do it all. I'm sure you've done it too. You know, I've gone out and I've been playing with groups, and you know, heck, I bogeyed the first four holes, and even on the fifth hole, got a double bogey. Just kept my etiquette right, and just kept my head right, and and, and making sure you know I'm working at it because I want to give myself a chance to recover. Right. Yeah. As long as I can maintain that, then I can turn this around. And I've done that. I've mm-hmm. turned it around, you know. Yeah. The thing that I've noticed is like a lot of times you get two different types of because sometimes you get a personality of people who have like former athletes or they're used to like other sports like um, like I did wrestling and I did like some other things. But so if you get guys like from like other sports, they think that with golf, they can like take it head on like that and just put a ton of physical work into it and get 
like a lot out of it, you know, be just because like I'm working really hard. Look, I look at how many balls I hit or how much, but with golf, you got to be, if you're not doing the right things and you're not like putting like, for example, like a lot of people would be excited to beat balls, but like when it was raining, how many people are going to like do the body work stuff and, right. uh, you know, and, and like these little things that are, that are very important, but it's like, they're, they're big general motion stuff. That's it's like that's the things that I see people not really doing that um, figuring out a way and being creative enough with yourself to figure out a way to start uh, tricking yourself into doing something differently. So if there's like let's say, let's say you've noticed that there's somebody in your team that has started has started to develop a bad habit, you know, like in something that they yeah. it's something that they've been doing. And you, you might have noticed it once or twice and you thought it was a fluke. But then after a while, you start to see like, hey, like this guy, like all the time is whatever. When he's lifting his gun across, right. he's going head high or something like that. Yep. And it's yep. becoming a bad habit. So what do you do to train a bad habit out of somebody like out in, in like a war zone? Uh, well, you know, if there's something like that, that would be, you know, um, you know, the thing that was like a lot of times it's going to be your peers, right? Your peers are going to see it. They're going to bring it up to you. And then, you know, if it gets noticed or, you know, it'll be, it would be addressed immediately if it's a safety type issue, you know, let's say if it was a weapon or poor weapons handling, like that's dealt with immediately on site, Mm -hmm. right? That's like any of that. But, you know, a, a real big thing is, is, you know, it's not really, it's coming down on someone. It, it could be, I wouldn't say maybe, maybe not a habit, but there's just, there's different people have different spatial awareness types of things in their mind and their minds. So some people don't are able to visualize the insides of buildings and choreograph things to a certain, it just takes them more time. It takes them more repetition. And if it's one of those things, but a lot of the basic skills are like, you would talk about like fundamental safety, fundamental stuff like that. That was built in. That was built in while going through training, big time, because you lose students uh, to those types of things, uh, even very late in training. Yeah. If it's you get you get student, out if it's something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They could have made it through Hell Week. They could be they could be a week a week away from graduating. Um, you know, really elite program. And if they've you know if they if they become unsafe with the weapon, uh, they probably they they will probably be on the sidelines at graduation. You know. So that's the thing that I'm noticing that's a big difference between golf and then like steel stuff that you're talking about is you got to get the whole team invested in one guy's improvement. Yeah, that's that you do. You do. I mean, there's other trainers, you know, they hire shooting specialists and they hire, um, you know, mostly from within a lot of guys in the community that were did an exceptional amount of operations or have tons of background and certain types of skills uh, but they become the knowledge base and the instructors for those types of you know different events and there's various there's so many different you know there's diving there's combat diving there's yeah you know, cqc land warfare stuff and the skills you yeah. know even guys getting into uavs all kinds of different yeah different disciplines a lot of you know retired seals come back and do a lot of the training for the seals um so yeah there's there there's they're, they're definitely always pouring resources back into the community with fresh tactics you know so like unlike golf like where there'll be a lot of players and even good players that that will like have never taken a lesson like if you want to get in the right. seals you have to get pretty used to taking lessons and to yeah. taking instruction yeah you need to that's that's certainly evaluated and that's evaluated, you need to be like, you would hear this where you need to be a trainable person, right? And there's people that just process information differently. And a lot of times those people that have that type of mentality or they just don't learn that way, they might not make it through to the end of the training. You know, they they need to be able to take instruction in a very direct and difficult manner. And, you know, you're given a few tries at it and then you know, just understand you, you're constantly being evaluated. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, whether you have 20 years in the seals or whether you have one year, you're both getting the exact same scrutiny with respect to, you know, seal disciplines. 
All right. So are, are there any like mental techniques? Cause I know like, let's, let's say like you're out on a mission and the mission has to get done, but like, you know, you get like injured and, um, right. and you still have to like perform at the, at a very high level or even the same level as if you weren't injured on the golf course, you know, injuries will happen and you'll still have to play anyway, but more often you'll get like a mental injury, like you just said. Of course. And, and, and like, uh, you know, something will happen or you're just like, you know, you're, you're doubting yourself or, you know, all of a sudden you slice three shots in a row and, and, and you're, but are there any like mental techniques that you can say like, okay, like this is not ideal. This is not good at all, but I still got to be able to perform. Are there any kind of mental techniques that you can take us through that could get us to maybe perform even when we're not feeling our best or playing our best? Uh, you know, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, a, a lot of times I use other experiences that I had, if I'm really, if I'm really nervous, you know, I try to tell myself, you know, I've, it's, it's silly, but I'd be like, Hey, there's nothing to be scared of. There's no one, there's no one pointing a gun at me. You know what I mean? There's not yeah. bullets flying around, but that would be me. Other people probably wouldn't, you know, wouldn't take it or think that ex to that extreme. Yeah, it was just, it was a no quitting attitude. I remember, you know, like I said earlier about giving yourself in a round, let's say you start off terribly, keeping your mind about you and giving yourself a chance to recover, right? And I will see that both when I play, um, I've seen it just start raining a little bit and people just fall apart in a tournament. And I ended up doing what better than I should have done in the tournament just because it started raining and they didn't they didn't stop the tournament. They just let it rain on us and everything was soaked. And I just saw just people just getting so sad and upset about that. And they were they didn't even care where the ball went. And I ended up moving yeah. up like seven or eight places and yeah. I would see them getting upset. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, this. Yeah, it's raining, but it's not cold. You know what I mean? Like it, it was warm rain. Just hang in there, man. Keep get, keep getting into the hole. You know, right. but people just fell fell apart. A, a great saying that they used in the SEAL teams. I learned it when I was going through land warfare training. I uh, he was like, uh, hey, you know, he asked everyone. He was like, hey, what's the best way through an amb? What, what's the best way out of an ambush? Right? And everyone might might have their own opinions. Or whatever but you know in the end they tell you it's like the best way out of an ambush is through it so it's really when you get ambushed you need to attack fear you don't need to run away from it right so mm -hmm. it was uh, it was a great way to you know help you have an aggressive mindset and then also you know look at things on removing fear remove fear everywhere both in your life and in your golf and what was the connection you make between maintaining like still being able to perform well and maintaining your etiquette and maintaining your your composure with the other golfers i, I know well, that you the, one have thing, the one thing that i don't want to do because i come from a real team type background is i don't want to affect their play right so that's a big one it's like hey mine might be bad whatever i'll get through it i'll get over it i maintain my etiquette but I make sure that I don't affect a playing partner by blaring out something obscene or whatever over and over again when things start cascading, which they do sometimes in golf. And, you know, I just think it's very, very important. And then by doing that, I give myself an opportunity, even if I'm not playing, to always recover because, you know, I can build my confidence back up over a couple holes. I may have even changed an entire round with a great iron shot into it. And it's like, suddenly I feel great, brings up the confidence for a little bit. And I go, okay, there it is. That's what I was waiting on. And I just ride that out the rest of the round and end up recovering. But if I let my mentally, if I just let that take, take, take me over on hole three, because I had a triple bogey and I don't want to fight the rest of the way uh, to try to find it, then, you know, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done after that point. So I think it's real important to, you know, just really maintain that composure. You just just maintain that composure and good etiquette. I mean, you want to get invited back, right? <laughs> yeah, all right. For you, I mean, you've been in situations where you're like, you're like, you're literally scared to death, and then you still have to play. What is uh, yeah. how does the how do the nerves of some of the craziest golf situations you've been in compared to some of the, like the war fighting stuff? Is it not even close, or is it? Uh, it's really, to be honest with you, I mean, you know, it's it's it's. I would have to say it's it's uh, it's 
to some of the things it's not even close. Yeah, you know, right, fair, right, right. But they give me that. Perspective, that that's sure. the perspective that yeah that I have. But that's not yeah. the experience of everyone that I'm around, right? So mm -hmm. that's that's how I would see it and kind of laugh it off. I was in a three-hole playoff. <laughs> Uh, I was well. I was in a playoff at the end of a. Um, it was a tournament on a military base, and I ended up. Uh, me and the other guy ended up tying. We had to go out and do a three or four hole playoff, and I lost that playoff. And uh, he he got me on the third hole with a birdie. And uh, you know, yeah, I was nervous, but you know, I was able to you know yeah. kind of laugh have some perspective. Go, yeah, this guy. Yeah. I was like, God, I just don't want to hit it in the woods. But I would remind myself, hey, you know, you're not getting to shoot that man. It's not that big of a deal. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's that's great advice for anyone, really. <laughs> you know, yeah, you, I mean, if you, you really, really think, you think about take it, it too like, serious, what, 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 you can what really you damage really, your, you yeah. really fear in here, man. You know, there's real fear out there, and that that that's not what it looks like. Right, right. I think the real fear in golf is just is uh, I think I, everything in golf, the good parts, like the the reasons that you want to keep playing, and then also the reasons that get you to feel like you want to quit. It's all ego. Golf is a, just a yeah. huge ego thing. To yeah, me, I think I think it's like uh, it's power, power over nature, power over your yourself, power over something that, you know, is super difficult and just like personal ego, you know, like everybody yeah. wants to talk to the guy that's playing really well and, and everybody avoids yeah, the, exactly. the guys playing bad. Like, like your report. Well, you know, a lot, so. a lot of it, too, is there's so much accountability in it, right? Like you don't get the accountability in a lot of places that you do in golf. And that's another real thing that I like about it. I own what I do, right? Uh, you have to own when you make a mistake in life, you have to own it when you're on the golf course and you can't run away from it. So, you know, that, that accountability piece can be really tough for people because they can't turn or, you know, once they hit a bad shot, they can't turn around and, and blame it on the environment or blame it on something around them. It, it all, it all, it all comes back to it all comes back to the individual, right? Yeah, there's a there's a golfer on our golf team, and he he's hasn't been able to do it yet. But I I gave him the challenge. I was like, I want you to play a, a full round of golf, and um, and you're not allowed to say if during the entire uh the entire round, right? Because yeah. every single shot he would hit, he's like, oh, if that had only landed a yard right. further, I'd be right there. Yeah. If that had only if that hadn't hit the cart path I'd be here or like if that hadn't hit this spike mark you know like I was like is it and he he literally can't go one hole without doing it so right. um or two holes maybe unless things are going just perfect perfect of all the people because we always see like how difficult it is to to get through uh you know we see so many documentaries and movies yeah. about getting through and getting onto the SEAL team what do you think is the big difference in the guys that that do make it through and the guys that don't They've never been able to mass produce seals. There's always an attrition rate between 75 to at times 90%. Some of that, you know, for each given class that goes through, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, you know, you know, I mean, you start out in your class has got 120 people in it. You end up graduating, you know, 20 of them, right? Wow. So that is, that. that's pretty typical. But generally it's... Um, it will be just that they're just not quitting, you know, like you just, you just hang in there. It's very standards based. So, you know, they give you all the information, like you got to pass this time and this and this and this, you know, you have to meet all these different standards. But the other piece of it is, is the entire time is, you know, you're 20 from the day you get there, you might be 120, but you whittle that down to a really, really good team of 20, 25, 30, you know, even 40, 50 people, it just depends. Um, but they're all working as a team, even during that point, just to get to the end of thing. And a lot of people never work in teams. They don't work in teams that are. Oh, okay. That, right. So they're not team players. You mean? Yeah. Players. And you'll yeah, see, they're not that. able to you'll work see with other that. People. Like yeah. it's like a yeah. cardinal, you know, it's a, it's a big thing. If someone's a real individual type person and if yeah. there's an, you know, it's detected or people feel like someone's like a selfish and is not, you know, taking care of the team. Uh, yeah, you, you're probably, you, yeah. you're probably not going to make it through there. You know, yeah. everything, I mean, everything every day. I remember, I remember I was, I went through, I was 26 years old, but I would be just 
destroyed at the end of days could hardly even move the next day they would and then you yeah. just had to get it up and keep doing it every single day and just right. you know, and you'd see people quit they quit for they'd fall apart mentally they might have all the athletic tools in the world they might have been the setting records at buds for the different runs and stuff that they had but as soon as they were put under stress and a lot of stress and the world they weren't the world just wasn't handing them you know glory one after the other and you know they've gone three or four days without sleep and then and then and then then they're just they're you realize that they're just not as tough as you envision them to be and it could I mean, there's just some incredible athletes that go through there but that mental aspect of it when they put you through some of the stuff remember it's a it's kind of a <clears throat> it's a marathon it's not you just go make it through a tough week it's like you got to make it through the whole six months and hope you hope you don't get you know, injured and rolled and have to go longer. However, I, uh, you know, you, you really have to be, you really have to contribute and you have to be very committed and just really want to be there and want to be one of the ones that graduate in the end, because it's just not a fun place to be. Yeah. <laughs> a lot I of bet. young kids, like, especially as a, throughout my career, I would get a lot of calls from dads and, you know, they'd be like, Hey, my son's going in and, and then I had a joke and whenever I would call them or I'd talk to their sons about it, about going into training, they'd be like, oh, you know, very interested, very young. You know, I would always start off the conversation with uh, with kind of like, uh, yeah, and I was like, hey, so what Bud's class are you going to? And he'd tell me, give me this or what, which, you know, when are you checking into San Diego? And I'd always tell them better you than me. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. That, that, that start I'm glad I'm not doing that anymore. Right. Yeah. Because I want to make sure it is it is not is not a fun, is not a not a fun experience. Yeah. Yeah. Good to have it in the rear view mirror. Um. Yeah. So the the challenge I would give be better golfers, and that I'll even give you uh, and myself really, is next time you play, try to go. It'll be impossible, but try to go the entire round without quitting on any shot. Yeah. So, and that could mean, that could mean any putt where you get, and it doesn't mean you have to take like a million years on, you know, like lining everything up, but, but the, by quitting, I mean, like, I mean, like sometimes you hit a lot of, you end up hitting a lot of anyway shots. Like, I wasn't sure about it, but I hit it anyways, or I didn't really have a clear <laughs> picture in my mind, yeah. but I hit it anyways, you know? So we hit no anyway shots and don't quit on any shot and just see what happens. You might, you might shoot worse, but I guarantee you'll learn some stuff about yourself, like especially like, cause the, the full swing is so complicated. There's so many moving parts, but if you yeah. really don't quit, you legitimately don't quit your putting and, and chipping can get really sharp just with that change of attitude. So yeah, totally agree. Yeah. And when you're out in the field, like doing, doing like war fighting stuff, like, like beyond training, how often does whatever you do, like happen the way you thought it would like plan wise? Oh, it's usually it's, you know, your plan just gives you a place to screw up from, you know, a lot of times, okay. you know, at least, you know, there's more, so many aspects to it. It could be, you know, whatever air support you have, how you're getting in, how you're getting out. There's many layers of that plan that can go wrong, but because you've got, you've done the planning, you've got some heads up on how to solve some of the problems on, you know, as you get into those. Right. So. You yeah, know, I wonder that some, yeah. Yeah, I wonder that sometimes with golf because it's like if you're not swinging well or if like you really kind of are scattering it, it's like sometimes a plan can can like feel like wasted calories because it's like, gosh, it's like this this plan I put in, this plan <laughs> yeah. I was thinking about, like this this isn't wor like working at all. But uh, you still think it's worth it's worth it's worthwhile to to have a, a good plan like that. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I tried to, you know, that planning, I did so much planning, especially towards so the, you know, you come in, once you come into the community, you, when you're learning to be a SEAL, that's the funnest time because you're just operating. All you have to do is show up and someone's going to train you. Everyone's got everything ready and you just go through training, right? Well, as you, you know, as you progress up in the, in the, in the thing that changes, you start being responsible for putting uh, a lot of that and there's, there's just there's a ton that goes into it you just you gather more responsibility 
uh, you know, like any organization, you know, as you as you get as you get further down the road, um, and you you become what you're really doing is you become the guy, you know, like I'm the guy that's thinking two years down the road. The guy that works for me, he's thinking one year down the road. You know, just like any organization. But the further you get up, the farther you're planning out. So I always have a planning mindset. So yeah, I'm always, you know, I like to, I like to tell, you know, I try to like to tell. If you would like to tell junior officers, I was like, you know, this is like where I got in my career. I started realizing at the end I had a pretty large crystal ball, and and I could really kind of see into the future sometimes based on things that came out. You could pretty much predict with a good deal of accuracy how things might end up, you know, even that, but that's having a planning mindset. And a lot of people don't like, I find a a lot of people in life um, that I run across that, you know, they, they hardly, they, they hardly look past their shoestrings. Yeah. Yeah. We're winging it. (laughs) Yeah. You know, they're just like, you know, just letting life find them. Right. So I think that it's different on a planning mindset. You just like it. It's a different way of thinking about it. Last question I want to ask you because because I'm having a hard time some with 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 some of the kids, a lot of the kids, yeah, on this co- the college team that I'm coaching. And so with the seals, like sometimes it seems different because everybody is so like it's like a highly selected group, and you gotta have to yeah. be like a high performance person. You do have to be a high performance person even to be in the group, and you also have to be like um, really bought into what you're doing. For um, sure with when I'm running like golf schools or when I'm like working with the college team, a lot of times like you get people that are like, like, you know, they're not showing up to things. It's like, they don't have that level of motivation that, that you wish they had, or you know, that they need to have. Right. Then like, you know, it's frustrating. Cause then like, you know, in the tournaments you hear them whining about, or you hear them complaining about like that they didn't, like performed the way they wanted to and you know and and you know like well you didn't really do what you needed to do to to make it happen right know? right exactly so so with the seals i don't know how much you guys get into this but like how do you get how do you like motivate other people to to show to get them excited about training well i guess you know it depends i mean with um you know being a part of those teams you know communication was effective and direct you know it was you know sometimes it's really hard you know yeah. it's not someone that likes likes a lot of confrontation right so everyone wants to avoid that especially in personal engagement everyone runs like yeah. hell and you know i think it's real important if you're going to be effective um as a leader especially like a coach or whatever those are some of the hardest jobs that you have to recognize and you have to get that person. You have to look them in and look them in the eye and be very direct about how you feel and understand that that engagement may not go that well. That person might walk off and you might feel like it was terrible that you made a terrible decision, but keep your mouth shut. You just planted a seed, give it a few days and and that that might come back around to you. They might really appreciate that candor because they had not seen it in themselves and i've had i can tell you i've been you know certainly i've been put in the situation many many times where i had to be the bad guy for someone and there was no other way to put it besides being really direct and hoping when they come back that they would react to it in the way that you wanted to but i can tell you that i've found that the more moral courage i had to do that because i wanted to do it and even though i knew it might have been difficult um i've been rewarded uh many many times for giving people the right feedback you know when they needed it and they what they end up they don't appreciate it at first they don't like it yeah that about it but you give it a few days and then they respect you for what you did and they start going maybe he's got something there heck you can you can change someone's life if you're you know, if you can remove your fear of wanting them to confront them about it, and you have to just give it a try and let it sit. Being like, right. if I can change this person and then get him to change one little last thing, get him to see the positive in that change, I can change outcomes. And that's what you want to do as a leader.
with for people. All right, Brock, thanks for thanks for joining us. Uh, I really appreciate it. And I'll be seeing you uh, hopefully in the next few months or so. Uh, everybody, if you're interested in if you watch this long, thank you very much. Brock has been communicating with me about some techniques that I've already put into play in some of the court at some of the uh, events. And um, I'm trying to become a better leader with a better leader with them. And uh, I think uh, it's going to help a lot of people. So thanks for watching, everybody. Click the subscribe button. Thank you again, Brock. Bye.